Introducing Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY on the OTCQB, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit Recyclico.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, hi, Jim. Here we are Friday morning in Vancouver, and yet another lovely sunny morning. It's summer has nice extended, after nice after nice. Summer has extended into well into October now, when mm-hmm. normally in Vancouver it would be 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Fahrenheit and pouring rain. Yep, or at least if not pouring rain, it'd be drizzling rain, but it remains dry. And uh, so, and very warm. Yep, and the, the hot, well, at least it cools off at night. <laughs> yes, it does. That's the, the nice thing here. So so 22 or 72 during the day. Perfect. Yep. Room temperature. Well, of that's... course, you know my comment on, on outside is I really like it when it's room temperature outside. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I can handle that. Bob, we start off the show with my question. Just how secure are our pension funds? We saw in the UK, after their mini-budget uh, panic in the bond market, they said the pension funds were going to collapse. And they did reverse that decision on their mini-budget. But uh, I just want to know, generally, uh, here in North America, how secure are our pension funds? Uh, not... As secure as one would hope, uh, we have been in the grips of a wild, crazy financial bubble, and the central banks have been easy during this wild bubble, and let's just use the Fed as an example. You had huge commodity booms completed in 2008 and 2011, which then, a decade later, after 2011, sets up the peak of a great financial mania, and we had that top in January. So the, uh, the, the, the bubble is the key thing, and uh, when it collapses, well, it is collapsing, and today's an ugly day, uh, bo- stocks, bonds and commodities head down but what we want to look at is that the error that the fed made and other central bankers is that it once that commodity boom came down after 2011 they then got concerned that was not enough inflation they had to keep it up at two percent otherwise something bad would happen so they they didn't understand that the world would history was in a great financial bubble and when they complete things turn really nasty so uh, they were easy with money and uh, then what really added to the price inflation in commodities wholesale prices and finally the CPI is that you had them go crazy about COVID and had the great lockdown which reduced supply and then at the same time, the guys over the central bank said, oh, this is our job now. We've got to ease money supply. So, uh, and the result is uh, inflation in consumer price items. But also, the inflation has been in stock and bond prices. So you're, the issue in, in England was that uh, many of these... Uh, in, uh, either life or casualty insurers are really out there in fixed income. And they have everything matched up with their actuarial withdrawals and the return they get. So they were trying to enhance their income by lending out bonds to people to make derivatives and things like that on them. 
and so the whole thing be kind of leveraged and then once the once the uh the selling and bonds came in and it was profound it was across the board from junk right through to high grade bonds which in England are called gilts uh and it was a mighty crash and the bank of england uh, was compelled uh, to do something i consider it just as a gesture so uh yeah it was uh, inflation and in bond prices and then deflation and bond prices and that is one of the features of the end of a great financial bubble and the and for low grade bonds around the world it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and they're down today even long trade dated treasuries are down today so it's it's not a safe world out there at all and people used to think bonds were the safest thing you could hold <laughs> uh the old canada savings bond yeah they were always redeemable at par at any time, so there was no price change. But any other bond uh, is, uh, that traded is uh, subject to price changes. And uh, so you get on the wrong side of the bond market, you're in deep trouble. But even when I started on the bond trading desk so many le- decades ago, we always had a quip where the, the, some of the uh, accounts were noted to <laughs> in a rally to come in right at the top. And that was called a get me in uh, order, GMI. And then, of course, they were always followed by a GMO market uh, exclamatory statement saying get me out. So, yeah, bond prices, uh, they are can be diabolical. And uh, the problem is that to a degree in the bond markets with uh, so many trading desks, the employment of leverage is way beyond what you get in the stock market. So this is where when when it goes against you in the bond market, it can be extremely painful. And this is what is happening to the uh, fund, as I said, pension or casualty insurers. Uh, they have to be long bonds. But then you have had bonds inflated to extraordinary, uh, well, treasuries or gilts inflated to extraordinary prices. So then they went down the quality scale and bought low-grade, well, barely investment-grade bonds, which, of course, in a post-bubble contraction, those investment-grade bonds will be downgraded to junk, in which case they have to sell anyway. So it's not going to be a pretty picture. One thing that I looked into a few times was that when the Soviet Union uh, came apart uh, following the takedown of the Berlin Wall in November uh, 1989 and then the first part of 90, many communist regimes around the world uh, failed. So I was couldn't find a real satisfactory answer, but what happened in the form in the Soviet Union, with all of those pension funds, I think many people got ended up on the wrong side of history on that one. So uh, uh, I'm going to, with your your suggestion, I'm going to take another look, another scan through stories about what happened to bonds and pension funds in the in the former Soviet Union when it fell apart. Uh- I was going to say, too, 1981, I remember well, because that's when Canada Savings Bonds paid 21% yep. at maturity. Yeah. And uh, so I scraped together every penny I could find mm-hmm. to buy them. Because yep. I, I just remember remarking, we'll never see this kind of return again. And, and we yep. never have. Yeah. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Paid for my wife's uh, master's degree. How about that? That's a good deal. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I told all everybody in the newsroom, oh, you got... Oh, 
I was the only one who bought him. Yeah. Reminds me of Tiger Williams. You think of him as a bonehead. He's a business genius. And they were going to take away their annuities for NHL players. It would be mm-hmm. just – and he was telling all the guys on the plane, he said one player listened to him. And, of course, years later they're all saying, Tiger, we should have listened. Because yeah. when other guys were playing poker or sleeping, he had a briefcase and a calculator, and he's pounding out the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. Bob, headlines that caught your attention today. Stocks sink, Treasury yield spike as Wall Street weighs jobs report. Yep. What's going on there? Jobs report. It, too many people focus on jobs report, and I never, ever look at them. And they got excited about it, and I guess something didn't go their way. Now, of course, uh, the U.S. unemployment rate fell to 3.5%. Canada's unemployment rate drops to 5.3%. But, Bob, this employment and unemployment statistics are skewed in both Canada and the U.S. because they only count people collecting un- or collecting employment insurance, and then once your qualification for that stops, you mm-hmm. statistically disappear. In England, yeah. they have a more complete rate because they just look at people collecting the dole. Yeah, and then a whole bunch of people found it was kind of quite all right to stay at home anyways and not go to work. But as I say, I don't really follow employment numbers. Do you think they put too much emphasis on them? Oh, there's a whole industry out there, cottage industry that follows employment numbers, but I I don't. I've been able, it's difficult to try and make money looking at, at something that you can't trade, like you can't trade the employment numbers. Aha! Bob, that's such an important thing. So, yeah. of course, you look at real money, not at yeah. statistics that already mm-hmm. are skewed and a lagging indicator. Oh, and then the one that got me in the liter- economic literature is the implicit price deflator. Now, where can you find that to trade it? <laughs> <laughs> Bob, a headline that caught your attention. Credit Suisse CEO seeks to calm as default swaps reach 2009 levels. What does that mean, and uh, does this mean we should be calm now? <laughs> That's what he's saying. Now, <laughs> when I first read that headline, I thought, oh, that seems to be trying to calm a general market. But actually, there were further headlines about Credit Suisse. The huge Swiss bank is in difficulties. So uh, this is what you expect when you get into the first part of a post-bubble contraction, is those that were playing recklessly uh, are discovered to, well, you know, when the tide goes out, <laughs> you see the ugly stuff at the bottom of the harbor. So the tide is going out. And the Credit Suisse is a very important company to follow uh, because it's a huge bank and it's in trouble. Now, here was a further headline a couple of days later. Credit Suisse options worsen as markets mayhem takes a toll. And now we're into another bad day in the financial market. So uh, this is this is not good stuff. But uh, as I say, I'm going to say it one more time: credits, credits, <laughs> credits. We in difficulty is a very serious problem. Swiss banking system is full of holes as their cheese. Ah, <laughs> yes. Headline: China's common prosperity drive morphs into common poverty. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. The their their common prosperity, uh, good intention, uh, good slogan. But uh, then, as we know, uh, since June a year ago, uh, China has been in the post bubble contraction. And uh, God, I just I didn't make a note on it, but I saw a, hit, a, a line the other day about Evergrande. You know, the one we've been mm-hmm. talking about, the big huge property developer. Well, its debt is something like three percent of all of China's GDP. So just one company is huge. And then, of course, here we are uh, with a, 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 an important bank in Switzerland underwater. So, yep. Well, and uh, I, I've seen reports of riots in China because people are very upset that they took out mortgages at the insistence of the government, even though they knew the properties were pretty shaky. And now, of course, they still have to pay off these mortgages in those huge empty cities with the crumbling buildings. Oh, yeah, absolute disaster. And it's not over. And it's not, and, and it, it'll turn really ugly. And there'll be kind of like a climax, a selling climax, uh, 
Oh, you don't know when, but you can recognize when things. And then, then that's part what would be the conclusion of this liquidity problem now. But in a post-bubble world, these problems don't get fixed overnight, and then they can never be fixed by such as the Bank of England coming in and bailing out their problem in the bond market. No, this is this just has to go until all the sellers are forced out. And who knows when that will be. But I remember uh, when doing the research, reading Barron's Weekly and the Economist Weekly through 1929 and into 1932. And it was in July 1932 when the first mighty crash following the high in September of 1929 kind of washed out. And uh, over a couple of weeks, you could see that there was no longer the selling pressure on any kind of bond in the bond market. It just the selling just quit, and then traders realized it was over, and then they bid it up to a pretty good market. So, but that to say, when you've studied these things in the past, um, and myself here, or even just over the last few weeks, you figure, okay, it's bad enough today. Maybe we can get a, a three-week rally out of it. But uh, Ross and I discussed it and said, nope, don't fall for that trap. This thing is in very serious decline. And just note that there will be pauses. They may last for a day or two. They may last for a week. But you haven't gone to the final washout of offside positions in stocks, in commodities, and in the bonds. So that is a, that's ahead of us. Uh, two headlines that seem to go together here. Housing slump economic angst sink consumer confidence in Canada. Home builders offer to sell homes in bulk at discount. Oh, yeah. So rather than yeah. selling them individually, they put them together as a whole package just to get their balance sheet in better, in better shape. So, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know how that one's going to go. We'll be watching for follow-ups on that one. Again, th- this reminds me, in Moose Jaw back in 1981, when a home builder, he'd built about a, a dozen homes, mortgage rates had gone up to 18%, nobody was buying, and he bulldozed them flat, but he ended up being hauled out of the bulldozer at gunpoint by police because he started to flatten the house that his wife was still in. <laughs> That's a story. That's incredible. Yeah, and, and so for weeks afterwards, people were driving through... This happened in my neighborhood uh, to see this bulldozer with two bullet holes in the front window Whoa. because he refused to get out until they fired warning shots. Good grief. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so oh, no, the, that's a very colorful story. Yeah. Moose yeah. Jaw, the home of the most softball players in Canada at the time. Mm-hmm. 35,000 people and 5,000 registered ball players. Anyway, wow. uh, uh, cute little town. Headline, central banks add gold for fifth straight month. Really? Gold yeah, is finally fashionable again? Yeah, it didn't uh, mention which banks. And, of course, I just grabbed the headline, but uh, let's go back five months was a pretty good high for gold prices. So the central bankers kind of got hung up on the convictions of buying high. My guess is, that, as you know, Jim, we stay with the gold's real price as deflated by the Consumer Price Index. And it is still bottoming, and then in post-bubble contractions, the real price goes up, which then prompts a fabulous bull market for gold stocks. So uh, my guess was that uh, the central banks wouldn't come in and, and seriously buy gold until the real price had gone up for a year or something like that. So I was talking with Ross about this one the other day, and, and uh, he, we, we both real concluded that that the decision to buy the gold was done at the top of the uh, nominal price in dollars. So, uh, And a headline here that I, I just saw, Canada steps in to buy Juno Beach property to keep it from being turned into condos. Juno Beach is where the Canadians stormed ashore on D-Day in France. So, yeah, June 1944. June 6th. Yeah. Ah, The Longest Day, as Rommel put it. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah great movie, well, great book. I think that's a worthwhile move to kind of protect that from being developed. Uh, uh, so, uh, so many men on the Allied side 
had lost their lives or were seriously injured on that invasion. So, Canadians, the only ones to reach their D-Day objectives, they had to pull back because they didn't have any support on the flanks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Americans took on the heavy lifting on that one, and they took on the most difficult sector, and it, uh, uh, and it was difficult. So, yeah. so uh, a salute to all the men and women who fought hard to gain that soil. Yeah, I'm with you, Jim. Yeah. Bob, have a great weekend. It looks like Vancouver's going to ha- continue to have summer-like weather for the next five or six days. Well, the drought is still on, but yeah. at least it cools off at nighttime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jim, next week. Next week. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. He was speaking to us from Vancouver. If you have any questions for Bob, he loves to answer them. Send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Howstreet. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.